Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. How amazing that tonight we're going to be in Hebrews 9.20 when I mentioned Hebrews 9 earlier today. Let's read this. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. And in this version, this is the New King James, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Now let's read this in context here. One, two, three, four. Um, okay, let's start in verse 13, a little more than five. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, and this is something pretty interesting for what we have going on right now because a lot of people are watching that, Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more than those things that they're doing? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What dead works? Dead works are the good things we do every day. If they're not done in God, if they're not done in Christ, they're dead. He's cleansing us from that stuff. He makes those things, when we do them for Christ, mean something. Verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Christ is, no one else, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. He picked us for this, guys. We were chosen for this. The Bible makes this very clear. Now, that doesn't mean you're pre-saved. He'll get you in there. But we, we were called, and we're called for a reason. It's for a purpose. I don't fully understand what it is. I don't know if any of us do, but that's okay. Verse 16, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. That was the first thing they did. It was the first thing they did. Do you remember when the first covenant was made? A lot of people say that was the law. No, it was not. This covenant right here, if you go back and look, this covenant right here was 436 years before the law was given to Moses, before the law, the covenant of the law was enacted. It was given to Abraham. And it said, this will be to your offspring, this to your descendant. Not all, but the singular, meaning to Jesus Christ. The Testament started almost 500 years before the law ever appeared on the scene. Jesus was fulfilling that testament in his death on the cross. So that testament came first. The law filled in the gap. And that's what its purpose was. Jesus dealt with that on the cross. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. And that was what happened. God said, give me your son Isaac. Abraham said, okay. And then God stopped him, and they ended up doing the bullock. So it was sealed at that, too. Verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Now that was a covenant for them. Within the covenant of Christ was the covenant God made with the Israeli people. How funny that he made the covenant with Abraham for successive generations. Mainly it was Jesus. That was the focus of that speech. Everybody else ended up falling into place with it because he was going to come out of their line, their lineage. But he also made another covenant with the Israeli people within that covenant. And that was the covenant of the law. Then likewise... He sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. You must have the blood. 
How, we now have the, we now have Christ. We have his blood now. So there is no need to shed blood anymore. Verse 23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Instead of sacrificing animals in heaven, it's sacrifices of ourselves. For Christ has not entered the holy places, made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, which is the, much of people's belief today, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, it's the last age before Notice it says ages, it's multiple ages. This is the last age. We're in the end of the last age. Remember, there's, there's three of them, each running about 2,000 years. We're in the last, we talked about that earlier. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is his appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Everything was done in the sequence it was done in for reasons, for a purpose. Very specific. Very specific. And Christ had to die. Not only did he have to die for salvation, but he also had to become the final sacrifice to perfect the law in the earth. He didn't destroy it. He nailed it to the cross. But that law didn't go anywhere. It's still there. He perfected it by being the perfect final sacrifice for it. Because up until then, even being perfect in the law, like Paul said he was, that still didn't get you into heaven. It still did not give you access through the Holy of Holies. You still had to have the sealing of the covenant to open the door. And now the door is open and we can come to the throne room. Perfect set of it. There is a strange power about the very name of blood. And the sight of it is always affecting. A kind heart cannot bear to see a sparrow bleed. And a less familiarized by use turns away with horror at the slaughter of a beast. For a lot of people who've never seen it, Butchering an animal or seeing an animal be butchered is very horrifying for them. As to the blood of men, it is a consecrated thing. It is murder to shed it in wrath. It is a dreadful crime to squander it in war. I know some men personally that I served under who are going to have to answer for the blood on their hands. Is this solemnity occasioned by the fact that the blood is the life and the pouring of it forth the token of death? We think so. When we rise to contemplate the blood of the Son of God, our awe is yet more increased, and we shudder as we think of the guilt of sin and the terrible penalty which the sin-bearer endured. Blood, always precious, is priceless when it streams from Emmanuel's side. The blood of Jesus seals the covenant of grace and makes it forever sure. Covenants of old were made by sacrifice, and the everlasting covenant was ratified in the same manner. Oh, the delight of being saved upon the sure foundation of divine engagements which cannot be dishonored. You can mess it up under the law. You can't mess it up under Christ. Salvation by the works of the law is a frail and broken vessel whose shipwreck is sure. But the covenant vessel fears no storms, for the blood ensures the whole. The blood of Jesus made his testament valid. Wills are of no power unless the testators die. The will, and you write a will, it is absolutely not legally binding until your death. Then it becomes legally binding. In this light, the soldier's spear is a blessed aid to faith, since it proved our Lord to be really dead. Doubts upon that matter, there can be none. He was dead. He died. He didn't faint. 
He died on that cross because when that spear was shoved into his ribs, they purposefully shoved it in a place that would rupture organs and penetrate his heart. He died on that cross. There are Christians today, quote-unquote Christians today, that believe he didn't. Wrong. If he didn't, and you believe that, you've got a huge issue because that means you're still in your sins. And we may boldly appropriate the legacies which he has left for his people. Happy they who see their title to heavenly blessings assured to them by, the, by a dying Savior. But has this blood no voice to us? Does it not bid us sanctify ourselves unto, whom, unto him by whom we have been redeemed? Does it not call us to newness of life? Evidence of salvation? A newness of life. Not renewed the old life, a new life. Does it not call us to newness of life and incite us to entire consecration to the Lord? Oh, that the power of the blood might be known and felt in us this night. The series of events, a sequence of events that put all this together was incredible. It was perfectly timed and perfectly orchestrated. Now, over the years, people haven't understood why this happens. We are blessed to live at the end of the age and be enabled to look back and look at how the timeline unfolded. They couldn't see it because they were in it. We can look back and follow along. Excuse me. And follow it along. And see how it unfolded. Now, what does that tell us? shows us the perfection of the fulfillment. We see every bit of it being fulfilled. The Lord today has gone to great lengths to raise the old stuff up out of the ground to reveal the evidence to the world. Look, you don't think these things happened? Look, here you go. Here's the evidence. Here's the city. Here's the boat. Here's the crossing. Here's everything. They're still trying to figure out where all those, uh, why, how all those uh, chariots got down there on that little land bridge. It's the only spot that's relatively shallow across the Red Sea. And it is strewn with human bones, horse bones, horse hooves, and chariots. Even the lead chariot being on the correct side where there's a pillar with Moses and the 12 tribes name on it. The gilded wheels. That was the lead chariot. It had golden wheels so everybody could see them. God did that. They're still puzzled why they haven't found any shields or weapons. Well, that's because the Lord in the Bible washed them up on the shore and gave them to the children of Israel so they can defend themselves. But they found it. People say there's no proof. They're wrong. All the proof is there. Every bit of it. And every day they find more and more and more. Every day they find new evidence that proves everything the Bible said. At this time in history, there is no reason for somebody to stand there and say, it's not real, really. Have you bothered to take a look at the evidence that's out there, or are you too scared you might get proved wrong? Because the only thing I see is fear. They don't want it to be true. They desperately do not want it to be true. Well, a big wake-up call is about to happen. If you watch the video I did at 3, the big, a big wake-up call is about to happen. We are on the cusp of everything in this world changing so drastically. But funny enough, we're not even going to be here to see it. It's going to happen right after we're, we're removed. Sudden destruction will come upon them. It doesn't get better than this. What the Lord has presented to us, what he has given us, what he has arranged for us. Now, it's funny enough, he didn't do it for us, he did it for him. That's not selfish. He wants to be glorified, and he will be glorified. But we end up becoming the recipients of it because of what he did to glorify himself. So in us, he will glorify himself. He does that in the life you live. He does that in the things that you do. He does that in, in your job, and your home, everywhere. I see Christians driving down the road, speeding, playing with their phone. 
Yelling at people and giving them the finger out the window. That's not Christian behavior. I saw a lady doing that. Man, she was giving this guy all kinds of grief in front of us. Going through the the, what, the four way big intersection up there, uh, heading into two, uh, New Braunfels, and she had a little Jesus fish in the back of her car, cross hanging from the rearview mirror. What an example you're setting to the world. Gandhi said, "I love your Jesus, but I don't really care for your Christians." I wonder why. See, there's a ton of false professors in the world today. They haven't been changed. They haven't been converted. Because if you ask them, sit them down and ask them about this, they have no idea what this is talking about. They have no clue. Well, they're about to learn. I believe these people are going to end up being the group, the great multitude. The great multitude of people that no one can number. A couple of, couple of billion from what it looks like. They're going to come to the realization of the truth after the rapture. Because when the rapture happens, everybody's going to snap to and go, whoa. That's in the Bible. And when they go to find it and read it, they're going to read the scriptures surrounding it. They're going to find our letters, maybe, if the Lord lets them. And they're going to see with new eyes. And this covenant is going to become very real to them. Now, unfortunately, this covenant ends at... The rapture of the church from every indicator I can find in the Bible. That's the end of it. It's it's fulfilled. Age of grace, over. Everything from then for that seven years is going to be completely different. And then the millennial reign is going to be even different again. This is important for us to know what's been done. First, the promise was given to Abraham. Then the covenant of the law came to Israel afterwards. It was given to Israel and only Israel. Then Jesus fulfilled the first covenant that was started with Abraham at the cross. And in the process of him doing that, he sealed both covenants. He sealed the covenant of grace and he sealed the covenant of law, nailing it to the cross, took, taking away the restrictions, taking away the bindings and the chains from it. So that we could have access to the truth. And now the last 2,000 years has been the testing, the time of testing, the time of choice, the time to see. And it's been a purging, and it's been a gathering of wheat and gathering of tares. Now that we're at the end of this age, and if you watch that video I did at 3, you saw some of the math. It's really starting to add up now, like really, not really close. It's all coming out to its final fruition. You're not here by accident. You're not saved by accident. You were chosen for this. The Lord died for you on the cross and shed his blood for you to pay for your sins, to wash you and make you clean. Rejoice that you have this. It is such a precious, such a specific royal gift given to you by the creator of all things. May we learn more about this and understand more of what's been done for us because I think that will give us a much better perspective on how we are to be here. Because if we know what was done for us, what would that make us do here while we're still alive? How would that make us respond to things? Something to think about. Do you know what your Lord has done for you? Do you believe what your Lord has done for you? And do you believe the word he has given you? Because if not, I highly recommend you read it again. Start in John. Do everything in John. I did a playlist on it. Go through all of John's writings first until you are rooted in the truth. Then branch out. Learn what he's done for you. Study what he's done for you. Know what he's done for you. So when they ask why you're a Christian... Because my Lord saved me. And that's good enough for me. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.